Thank you, Kate, and welcome to Inside Politics. I'm John King. Thank you for sharing your day with us. Wall or no wall? Congressional negotiators meet this afternoon to begin crafting a big border security package. The president says it's a waste of time if he doesn't get his wall money. Plus, they are wrong. The president launches a morning tweet storm questioning the judgment and the smarts of his own top intelligence chiefs. And the battle of the billionaires, Trump, Bloomberg, and Niall Schultz, Elizabeth Warren, meet Howard from the hood. I grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, New York. I came from the projects. We were completely destitute. Back, back to that in a moment, but we begin the hour with a big meeting this afternoon on Capitol Hill with an agenda that seems like a mission impossible. Finding consensus on the border security issues that just led to that partial government shutdown. A bipartisan group of lawmakers meeting this afternoon for the first time. Their deadline? Only 16 days away. President Trump setting the tone on Twitter this morning saying, if the committee of Republicans and Democrats now meeting on border security is not discussing or contemplating a wall or physical barrier, they are wasting their time. That from the president, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi essentially telling the president in response, but out. I think we're, the conference can reach a, 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 a good result left to its own devices without an interference from uh, everybody else. I, I have confidence in the appropriators. President, stay out. See, that's Phil Mattingly now live up on Capitol. Phil, this is the beginning. Uh, set the table, and what do we expect on this day one, getting to know you? A real live public conference meeting, and I'm like, very excited about that, which says probably more about me than anything else. Look, this is how it's supposed to work. Usually one chamber passes a bill, the other chamber passes a bill, they meet in a conference to reconcile. What's different is conference committees have kind of fallen by the wayside in recent years, and public conference committees have become even more rare. Here's what we expect today. A Democratic aide tells me that House Democrats will use as a base proposal a Department of Homeland Security appropriations bill that they've been working on behind closed doors for the last several weeks. So when that is unveiled, that'll be a good tell about where Democrats are and what their baselines are. What that proposal will not include? A border wall. That's no secret. Democrats have been very clear that that's their position, at least starting out uh, at the current point. What it will include, I'm told, is billions of dollars extra or added for border security, something they've been talking about for a number of weeks. The bigger question right now is where Republicans on the Senate side, where they hold the majority, what they're going to put on the table. Obviously, the president's proposal from last week that failed in the Senate. Uh, there was a bipartisan Senate proposal last year that had about $1.6 billion for fencing. That could be on the table somewhere as well. But what I'm told right now is that Senate Republicans want to see what House Democrats put on the table before they start moving forward. That said, as the president made clear in his tweet this morning, the baseline and the main point of contention still remains a border wall. Now, appropriators, John, as you know better than anybody, are well-known deal makers, deal makers that could figure out a way to, to kind of finagle the language to give fencing or bollard wall or anything of those natures. I think the big question right now is twofold. One, can they accept that? Can anybody accept a compromise language given their baselines? And two, what Speaker Pelosi was talking about earlier, can the leaders stay out of this? It's not just Democrats who have asked the president to stay out of this negotiation. I've talked to a lot of Republicans who will say the same thing. We'll have to wait and see whether or not that happens, and we'll have to wait and see what kind of progress they make today in that first meeting, John. Phil Manning is excited about a public conference committee. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Phil. Let's make this, let's see what we get here. With me in studio to share the reporting and their insights, CNN's Abby Phillip, Carl Holst with the New York Times, Matt Viser with the Washington Post, and Politico's Eliana Johnson. Uh, let me start with you since you cover the White House. Uh, Speaker Pelosi says the president should stay out of it. Um, doesn't that morning tweet tell you that he's already not staying out of it? <laughs> I think he is already reading the tea leaves about where this is heading. I mean, the, the real question about President Trump is, uh, will he allow this conference to go forward? And then at the end of the process, what will he do? I mean, right. he has had a habit recently of uh, allowing lawmakers to do what they do, and then at the very last second, uh, pulling back his support from something that they think have, has the votes to pass, and creating a lot of chaos in the process. We don't really know what lesson the president learned from this uh, basically failed shutdown of 35 days. Uh, it seems that he uh, he internalized some of the criticism from the right. Uh, he seemed to brush back Ann Coulter, uh, saying that, that perhaps she's mad because he didn't return her call. But it's not clear whether he's decided that he can move forward without their endorsement or if he does believe that Ann Coulter is fundamentally correct, which is that if he doesn't get his border wall, he could be risking his reelection in 2020. <coughs> well, only time will tell how he finally comes down on that decision. 
decision, and it could be at the very, very last second. And it could go back and forth over the course of the 16 days. We don't know what this is going to look like at the end. There are some proposals. Some people say, let's keep it small. Let's just deal with border security. Keep it there. Don't make it complicated. Uh, the Treasury Secretary, apparently listening to Senator Lindsey Graham, says maybe we should add the debt ceiling to this. You know, more quicksand. Let's add quicksand to quicksand and let everybody go in the room and debate that. Uh, but, Carl, you spent a long time on this issue you, when they used to have committees like this, yeah. when this is how government actually used to work. Um, we do know this. The president's not getting a piece of paper that says, here is $5.7 billion for you to spend as you wish on your wall. Yes. That's just not going to happen. I think that's true. There won't be a big diagram of the wall on right. the final conference report. I think the thing you have to remember is the pain on Capitol Hill was bad in the shutdown, really bad. No one wants to go through this again. When Mitch McConnell says yesterday, I'll do whatever it takes not to go through that again. And I think the secret that people don't realize is the appropriations process has been the thing that's been working during the Trump administration with Republicans and Democrats, but they've kind of ganged up on the administration in writing these bills. I think these appropriators can get together and come up with a deal. And they're going to, but there's going to be something that's fencing or a barrier. You, you heard Hakeem Jeffries yesterday say, well, we can go with fencing. There's a big semantics game that's going to be played here. These guys are professionals at coming to a compromise, and they work very closely together all the time. I think they can do it. I think. But not only does Donald Trump probably need to keep some distance, Nancy Pelosi might want to keep some distance, too, for a while, because to the Republicans, she's polarizing. Yesterday, they're, they're raising, well, will she even uh, go along with the conference report? Well, yeah, of course, if they come out with some kind of deal that there's an agreement on. But I agree with both you and Phil. Good to have conference committees back. <laughs> People haven't really even seen so, how they work. Yeah, America is groaning at us. But, but, but look. These, these are elected representatives from around the country. One of the reasons we have partisan gridlock is we have an evenly divided country. So put them in a room, and the, as most of it is transparent as we can see. Here's one member here. This is Chuck Fleischman, Republican of Tennessee, who says, you know what, to Carl's point, put us in a room, we can figure this out, and guess what? We might have to spend a little more. I don't think we're miles apart. I think there's a lot of common ground. I think there's a lot of very strong passions in the room. Is it still going to cost $5.7 billion? Well, ultimately, probably more than if we go down that path. Bear this in mind, whether we call it a wall, a barrier, a deterrent, that is only one aspect of the full border security situation. Which gets you to the question, so it looks like they're going to, okay, here's several billion dollars, maybe in excess of the $5.7 billion, uh, with some specifics, ports of entry, uh, drug you know, screening, uh, other new technologies, and barriers fencing, the language worded in a way that everybody can say, I win, is that enough for the president? Or do we end up having a national emergency or some other executive action to say, never mind, I'm going to find my money over here and build a wall? Democrats are open to providing money for anything that's not labeled a wall. They're open to providing money for ports of entry and for other uh, things under the broad rubric of border security. The question, I think, is precisely the one you pose, which is, what will the president sign on to? I think his negotiating position is weakened, uh, his leverage is weakened, because Republicans on Capitol Hill don't want another shutdown, and they don't support a national emergency. The president, of course... And many of them don't even support the wall. If enough of them supported the wall, he would have got it in his first two years. Uh, well, the, I think if the actually, if the president um, and, his, and the administration had really pressed that case, he could have gotten the funding he's now requesting, but he didn't. Uh, he didn't make it a priority when Republicans had control. But I do think that his leverage is now weakened because Republicans uh, don't want either of those things. And for that reason, I think Republican leverage in these negotiations are weakened because they're not willing to uh, go to an extreme if, they, if Democrats don't give them what they want. They're not willing to shut down the government again, and they don't support the president declaring a national emergency, which makes the negotiations a bit trickier on the Republican side. I, I think Democrats, too, want to do something so they're not branded as the party against right. any type of border security. So they have a chance here to propose something that is not a wall, but that does enhance the border, which I think voters generally are, are, are supportive of. Uh, the other thing in the conference committee that's interesting is they're throwing in all of these extra sort of things to negotiate over, partly because so far it's been wall or no wall. So I think the thinking is that if you talk about some other aspects, then maybe you can start to make a deal, uh, whereas before it's been just an intractable position for both sides. A little dessert in with the broccoli and the peas, I guess is one <laughs> way to put it. Then you raised this point earlier. The question at the end is, 
who is the president listening to when push comes to shove, when they put a thing on the table? Who is he actually listening to? This is the former Speaker John Boehner, who says a lot of nice things about the president, about his tax cuts, about other things the president has done. But he says the president listens to the wrong people when it comes to issues like this. Uh, Boehner saying this, when I was looking for a legislative strategy, the last place I looked was talk radio. Boehner said. The second last place I looked was the knucklehead caucus, who don't know how to vote yes on anything. They did the president a total disservice. By knucklehead, he means freedom yeah. caucus. <laughs> uh, uh, that, you know, Boehner has his way of saying things. But he's essentially saying, stop listening to the Ann Coulters and the Mark Levins and the Mark Meadows and the Jim Jordans. Will the president do that? It's really, really <laughs> not clear, John. I mean, the president has an enormous amount of power over the Republican Party. He has a lot of support among Republicans. They follow him where he leads them. When he says, we need a border wall, Republicans, the polling shows that Republicans move in his direction. But at the same time, he has never really been willing to buck that you know, 25, 30 percent of the party, perhaps represented by the talk radio hosts and others, uh, in order to push the Republican Party in a direction that will allow him to govern. It's just not clear to me that he's there yet. I think he has come out of this shutdown really irritated by the coverage of what happened there, not willing to, uh, to acknowledge defeat, even though he did sort of do that on Friday in his speech in the Rose Garden. He spent the weekend trying to say that he didn't give in when he, in fact, did. Mm -hmm. So I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the president, it could it could be kind of like a boomerang. He could come right back uh, to where he was at the beginning of the shutdown and say wall or no deal. And then we could be uh, with a shutdown government again in a few days. Even in the age of Trump, where many rules have changed, if you say for a month, I will not reopen the government without my wall money, and then you reopen the government without your wall money, um, you lost. That's pretty simple. All right, we'll watch this when the curtain raises today, 16 days, the deadline. Up next, President Trump pushing back against his own intelligence officials. But first, a little flashback as we wait for this year's State of the Union. One year ago today, the president's first official State of the Union. Tonight, I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. These are the people we were elected to serve. CNN Breaking News. President Trump today launching a remarkable series of attacks on his own top intelligence officials, chastising them for being soft on Iran, among other things. In a series of morning tweets, he calls them, quote, extremely passive and naive about Iran, saying that the United States needs to be careful and suggesting, get this, perhaps intelligence should go back to school. The president is responding to yesterday's testimony on Capitol Hill on foreign threats, that in which his own intelligence chiefs seem to contradict the president on nearly everything, from ISIS to North Korea and Russia. ISIS is intent on resurging and still commands thousands of fighters in Iraq and Syria. We currently assess that North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities and is unlikely to completely give up its nuclear weapons and production capabilities. We assess that foreign actors will view the 2020 U.S. elections as an opportunity to advance their interests. The president probably didn't like a lot of that, but more likely this response from his CIA director, Gina Haspel, that may have triggered the president's Iran reaction. She's asked here, is Tehran complying? with the nuclear deal negotiated during the Obama years. They're making some preparations that would increase um, their ability to take a step back if they make that decision. So at the moment, technically, they're in compliance. Um, they are wrong. Maybe intelligence should go to school. Um, I was joking during the break, not really joking. Uh, it's one thing. We shouldn't criticize anyone who works for you. It's tough. It's hard to be the boss. I mean, unless they deserve it. But to publicly lash out at the people who are dealing with life and death issues every single second of every single day is pretty remarkable. This is a little different, too. For, I mean, he's done this in the past, criticizing the intelligence agency. But in the most vociferous he was on that was around the Russian investigation, whether Russia meddled. This is a little different. This is just him not believing what they're saying because what they're saying goes against his worldview on, on Iran and North Korea. Um, and, and so it, it's a little bit of a, of a difference for him to speak out this strongly 
Um, it, just because of a policy difference, it should probably be an internal thing, yeah, and not to, publicly. And, and the timing. I mean, in, in most of the older stuff was at Clapper and Brennan and Obama era people, who, or you know, maybe some of the new people who came. We're, we're two years in now. We're two years in. Those are Trump. That is a table of Trump appointees. So. That, that's true. Some of it was older, but I think this the hearing we saw yesterday with Dan Coats and Gina Haspel was a continuation of something we've seen uh, throughout the Trump administration, which is this two-track presidency, where you have the president saying one thing about intelligence assessments and his... Uh, appointees saying something different. We've heard that on Russia and we've heard that on North Korea where the president has said uh, they've denuclearized, we've made so much prog progress, everybody can sleep easier at night. And I think it's what makes often covering the Trump uh, presidency so difficult and understanding it difficult. Is the president often seems to be at war um, you know, with the office that he is in and with his own political appointees. And that really was on display at this hearing. Right. So sometimes the good cop, bad cop approach makes sense in the sense that you want the president to be optimistic saying can we cut a deal with China and his intelligence people to be telling you the truth. Sometimes it makes sense. This is parallel universe stuff. Yeah. It and it's a continuation of what Trump often does which is that he believes that he knows about pretty much everything more than the experts do. When in the campaign he said I know more about uh, about war than the generals do. I mean he continued that into his presidency and that's why it is so difficult for people who work for him to convey to him a fact-based information. The president has his core held deeply held beliefs uh, that the Iran deal is a failed deal is one of those deeply held beliefs and there's no amount of information that you can provide to him that will change his his view on that. His view view that the U.S. should pull out of conflicts around the world, that's a core belief. Uh, there is nothing that people have told him. I mean, his defense secretary quit over this issue. Nothing that people tell him about these issues that are based on fact and information on the ground is changing his view of it. It's what makes it so difficult to work for President Trump beyond just uh, what it looks like to the outside world. The, the dual track presidency is a real conflict within the administration for people who are really working in these jobs. It's a great point because we often say he's not ideological, but he is consistent on protectionism. He is consistent on a more isolationist approach, if you will, including wanting to get U.S. troops home uh, from Syria and from Afghanistan. And it's not just the intelligence chiefs, public this is the second day in a row. This is the Republican Senate Majority Leader for the second day in a row on the floor of the United States saying, saying, Mr. President, you are wrong. Our response to this progress must not be to take our foot off the gas pedal, but rather to keep up those strategies that are clearly working. Our partnership with Iraqi security forces and the Syrian Democratic Forces have stripped ISIS of much territory in those two nations. But we've not yet defeated ISIS. We have not yet defeated Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. His view of Republican foreign policy is 180 degrees almost from the president, the Republican president of the United States, is it not? Yes, and he is, he's sort of articulating what, what has been the standard Republican policy. You know, we need to engage. This is more uh, equal to the Bush administration. This is important. Mitch McConnell, who has been so closely allied with the president, not willing to cause uh, any trouble, two days in a row has gone out there. And not only speaking, he has an amendment to a bill that is going to establish this as the U.S. policy. So if that bill were to make it to the president's desk, it might present him with a problem. But they, they just don't buy what Trump is selling on foreign policy. We, they don't want to pull out of these places. They think we undercut our allies. And, you know, this is a real problem going forward. I think what everybody said is right. What is our foreign policy and who's in charge of it? I have to say, when I saw that tweet this morning, kind of to your point, I was like, how do you work for this guy, right? When he's going to call you out in public as not being smart, when you're ahead of an agency, that the entire job is to compile this information and if it happens to conflict with the president you know that's too bad i think it's a tough tough situation it's here a it's a tough place and yeah, amen to them for again they have the most difficult job for the government what they see is not pleasant stuff most of the time but boss disagrees up next stop me if you've heard this before a billionaire wants to run for president he says he's the only one who can fix washington This presidential deja vu all over again, with an independent twist this time. A billionaire flirting with running for president and sucking up a lot of the cable TV oxygen. He says the current president is in way over his head 
and that both parties are captives of the big money swamp. That was Donald Trump in 2015, when the former Democrat and Independent decided to run for president as a Republican. And that is Howard Schultz now in 2019, as the longtime Democrat says he is now preparing to run for president as an Independent. And so no are you longer, no longer a Democrat? No, I'm not a Democrat. I don't affiliate myself with the Democratic Party, who's so far left, who basically wants the government to take over health care, which we cannot afford, the government to give free college to everybody, and the government to give everyone a job, which basically is $40 trillion on the balance sheet of $21.5 trillion. We can't afford it. The former Starbucks CEO is giving Democrats fits, both with his talk of running as an independent and, as you heard there, his sharp criticism of liberal ideas. Add in one more Battle of the Billionaires twist. The former New York City mayor, Michael Bloomberg, like Schultz, believes the Democrats are drifting too far left. But Bloomberg says the best place to make that argument is in the Democratic presidential primaries. Schultz disagrees. Mike Bloomberg is not my proxy. Mm -hmm. A Democrat is not going to be able to... All of a sudden, if a Democrat becomes president, all of a sudden the government's going to start working. Nothing's working. I'm hearing from thousands of American people, thousands saying, finally, someone's voice that I can relate to that represents the fact that I no longer feel as if I'm a Republican <laughs> or Democrat. That's what they said about Trump. Finally, someone's voice I can relate well, to. Well, I'm not Donald Trump. Well, he says he's not Donald Trump. He says the president's not qualified. But there is a Trumpian flavor to this Schultz beginning, if that's what we're going to call it. Yeah, and I think his gamble here is to show some viability and get to like a 15% threshold that Democrats are already freaking out, but then they would really freak out. That's what he would need to get on a debate stage. So I think Schultz is using this sort of rollout to, to try and show some strength early on. And I don't think he minds the criticism he's getting from Democrats because he's trying to sort of chart good for his him. different yeah. path. Yeah. And he's trying to sell books in the process. Uh, the question is, well, he is, that's part, that's part of this. He's trying to sell books. Uh, but 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 the other part of this is, you know, he's going to show up no matter what. He's, the Republicans are already grabbing what he says about Medicare for all, what he says about the Elizabeth Warren tax plan, what he says about other, you know, Democratic spending proposals. Uh, they're already grabbing onto that, and they see him as a gift. The president himself tweeting earlier in the week, get in, get it, trying to goad him in. Oh, I think that the, the Democratic response to him, as well as Trump's response, are the best, they're the greatest thing that Howard Schultz could have asked for, because uh, in the same way that, uh, I mean, Trump is elevating him by giving him attention, and so are the Democrats, rather than writing him off, uh, you know, as, as a would-be candidate. And I think Schultz poses a far greater threat to Democrats by running as an independent than he would running in the primary, and that's why you hear Democrats pushing him to run in the primary. He seems to be somebody who would pull them to the center and that seems to be what they what they don't want the comments about Medicare for all and all that because he could be a real threat running as an independent somebody saying these guys are way too far to the left uh, what you need is somebody like me an independent and um, he could really be a threat if he stays out of that primary um, but is is still to the left of Trump and timing is everything in politics it's an old cliche it happens to be true uh, this rollout by Schultz coming as Michael Bloomberg planned his first big trip to New Hampshire Bloomberg's not happy about this. He thought about running as independent. He says you can't win. But he also is running a campaign which has a lot of the same themes as Howard Schultz. Free college tuition would be a nice thing to do. But it is just totally impractical to replace the entire private system uh, where companies provide health care for their employees would bankrupt us for a very long time. I think you could never afford that. You're talking about trillions of dollars. Number one, I think the Constitution lets you impose income taxes only, so it probably is unconstitutional. Number two, I don't know of any country that has done that. This is the week Michael Bloomberg wanted us to be talking about him as a potential Democratic ch candidate trying to pull the party back to the center. Instead, Howard Schultz has taken a lot of his oxygen. Yeah, I mean, not only that, but I mean, what, what is so interesting about these two billionaires uh, trying to gain some national attention is that a lot of people are like, do we really need more billionaires? I mean, is this what the moment is really calling for? And it does strike me that in some ways, while they do share business as a common factor with Trump, what they don't share with Trump is actually what I think Democrats are trying to take from Trump, which is the idea that these things in politics that used to seem like third rails maybe are not. Maybe when you put something uh, out there for the American public that, that a lot of people told them they couldn't have, uh, that maybe they gravitate toward that. Trump ran in a really unconventional way. He ran on things that Republicans didn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. And that's why you, I think you see a lot of Democrats finally talking about the 
the things the Democrats, the establishment Democrats didn't want to talk about for a long time. Bloomberg and Schultz are trying to run very conventional campaigns after Trump proved that the unconventional might be the thing the, that works with the American But, but my question was, what about the billionaire thing? Because people slapped that on Trump. Even Republicans tried to slap that on Trump. He said, what's wrong with getting rich in America? Yeah. In his case, everyone would say, well, you got a lot of money from your dad to get you started. Howard Schultz did grow up in the housing projects. Michael Bloomberg did start his own company. Uh, he didn't start as poor as Howard Schultz, but he did start his own company and made his millions. They say, isn't that what we're supposed to do in America? But this is Elizabeth Warren. Billionaires like Howard Schultz and Michael Bloomberg want to keep a rigged system in place that benefits only them and their buddies. And they plan to spend gobs of cash to try and buy the presidency to keep it that way. Not on my watch. She's going after him there. This is Sherrod Brown, who's on a tour now trying to decide, Senator from Ohio, progressive, trying to decide if he should run for president. Pretty much the same point. When I think about a billionaire running as an independent, we try we tried a billionaire in the last election, and the billionaire won. And look where look where we are. I want a, a, a choice between uh, Trump and a progressive Democrat. We're going to have that, uh, and I think it, we we've got to win the industrial Midwest, the heartland, the Great Lakes states, and the state you grew up, Chris, in, and the state that right. I represent, and and we change the country. The, the focus on people who work with their hands, the industrial Midwest, I get completely after Trump turns red to blue, uh, blue to red, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. But the billionaire thing, it's an easy reflex. Is it the right reflex? Well, p part of me wonders what's in Joe Biden's head right now, because he, he sees himself, I think, as the bridge between this progressive energy and this more centrist philosophy. And, and so I think as he weighs whether to get in, Schultz, I think his pathway is impacted by if, if a nominee is a Joe Biden or if a nominee is an Elizabeth Warren or somebody who's, who's seen as much more left. So I think that's the question, uh, you know, in my mind. And Schultz will, will certainly pull, I think, the Democratic primary towards a Joe Biden rather than an Elizabeth Warren. That's a great, that's a great point. It, does that happen in the sense that he says he's going to tour for three months? And he clearly, at least at the beginning, is getting attention. The question will be the impact as we go. It's a great, it's a good placeholder. We'll come back and check on that one. Up next for us here, a Republican governor scolds Congress while offering the secret to his success in his state. Republican. Thinking 2020, maybe? Topping our political radar today, what looks like bad news for President Trump's focus on job creation. Foxconn, a manufacturing plant in Wisconsin, says it's changing its plans. The company now says it plans to create a technology hub, which is a far cry from the factory full of blue-collar jobs that it promised the president. CNN's Caitlin Collins live at the White House. Caitlin, this was a huge initiative from the president. He's thought of this as big bragging rights. Uh, what's the White House saying now? Well, they haven't responded to our request for comment yet, but you can bet that President Trump is not going to be pleased because, John, not only did he hold a huge event here in the East Room of the White House for this company when they announced this, he also traveled to Wisconsin for the groundbreaking. And while he was there, he said this was evidence, this plant alone, that those manufacturing jobs were coming back to the United States, something that he promised time and time again on the campaign trail. Now the company says it's still going to build this $10 billion plant. It's still planning on hiring 13,000 workers, but it's going to look a lot different, John. Essentially, it's a reversal of what they promised this was going to look like, that it was going to be all these manufacturing jobs. And now they want to make a technology hub and hire researchers, developers, engineers, instead of those blue collar jobs that they promised. They say now that three fourths of the jobs will likely be those research, research and development ones, while only a fourth will be manufacturing jobs. That's not all. They still say they're going to hire those 13,000 people, but now they can't say when. And their, slow, their hiring pace is slowed compared to what they had projected for a certain amount of people they wanted to hire by the end of 2020. Now they say that number is going to drop significantly. And John, they were initially supposed to focus on building LCD screens at this plant in Wisconsin. Now they say citing cost and it's cheaper essentially to make them elsewhere. They're going to make them overseas. Then they're going to ship the final product back to the United States, which seems to go against exactly what President Trump has been touting about this company when he was doing so just as recently as last summer, John. Now we've reached out to the White House about this. What is the president's response? to this company completely reversing what it said that they were going to do and what the president was so proud of. But, John, they haven't gotten back to us yet. I'll wait for that response. Obviously, we showed the pictures at the top. The president at the groundbreaking could be quite embarrassing. Caitlin Collins, thanks. Let's bring it into the room now again. Uh, a president can't control what a company does. A president can't control market forces. A president can't control globalization. But a president can't control what he or she says about a specific company or what he or she says about a specific day in the stock market. This is the risk you take. Well, I saw someone tweeted this morning, Foxconn, one N. And this was a political uh, thing that the 
Governor Scott Walker was pushing there and Republicans in that state. This is a really a potential debacle for the Republicans in Wisconsin. They invested a lot in this. You know, Walker still sort of maintains some uh, political hopes for the future. People just feel like they got snowed. Yeah, and and that this is not, you know, it was a huge giveaway. It was controversial. And you're right. I mean, the White House uh, probably should have taken a close look at this, but if they were in this mode. We have to show manufacturing's coming back. Yeah, I mean, the president is, um, it, it, he can be credited for what has really been a manufacturing renaissance in some aspects of the economy, but at the same time, he never wants to talk about the trends that are actually happening in the economy. A move toward uh, skilled labor, a move toward uh, less labor and more machine uh, manufacturing in this country. He doesn't want to talk about those uh, those trends that are actually happening that are going to change whether or not the Midwest and places like Pennsylvania will have the same type of jobs that they had in the past. Uh, there is not going to be much that Trump can do to reverse those things that are just a result of globalization and advances in technology. And in the all politics is local department, Wisconsin. Remember, one of the states he flipped to become president. This will be an issue in 2020 without a doubt. Next, the 2020 question that could define Democrats. Can the country really afford free health care?